David oh, bueno. Suzuki, and this, if you hadn't already guessed, is information. This, too, is information. And so is all of this. This is also information. In the computer world, it's all called information. Computer graphics, pictures, words, data, even video games. And we can have it all, apparently, on the information superhighway. But when does information become information glut? From imaging to 3D animation, computers let us do things we were never able to do before. In less than 20 years, they've changed the way we do business and communicate with one another and how we entertain ourselves. Combined with television, the computer is defining the next step in the age of information. It has also set the stage for big profits in the marketplace. At the center of all this activity is the personal computer. About one in every three people in Canada owns a personal computer, and many more work with one at home or in the office. Paul Sappho of the Institute for the Future. Now the devices on our desks today look kind of like PCs, but they're very different in that they're increasingly being defined by what they connect us to rather than by what they process for us on our desks. These are portals on an ever-growing information landscape that, moreover, will be a landscape that we spend more and more of our everyday lives in. It's a landscape with expanding horizons. Everything will be fully connected. You will be able to play games with children down the street or on the other side of the world through your television set, through your personal computer. You will have access to all the publishings of people throughout the world. For the first time in world history, we're altering the speed with which human beings exchange information by a factor of 10,000 in a two or three year time span. Never heard of before. The personal computer was a revolution because it brought the microprocessor to our desktop. Well, today, microprocessors are so cheap that the notion of just having one on our desks is quaintly idiotic. And instead of having just one general purpose device on our desk, we're going to have multiple electronic devices in our lives. We will carry some on our persons, we'll have them in our briefcases, information appliances in our cars and our houses. We'll have this, this ecology of information devices fitting into different parts of our lives. The information highway builders want to use these electronic devices as interactive communication tools. The dream is the marriage between the TV and the computer, interactive TV, in the so-called home infotainment center. There, right in your electronic living room, you'll be able to order movies on demand, shop and bank at home, receive any number of customized services from a menu of entertainment and information choices. U.S. Vice President Al Gore has called the information highway the most important marketplace of the 21st century. And every cable, phone, computer, and entertainment company on the continent wants a piece of that market. And they're falling all over themselves to sell us their version of the information highway. Faster than a speeding bullet, today's information superhighway agreement will unite AT&T's international telecommunications equipment and expertise with the massive information storage and retrieval capacity of Silicon Graphics Challenge Server Computers. This joint venture is just one of dozens of mergers between communications and entertainment companies anxious to build the information highway. Time Warner is joining AT&T and SGI in staking millions of dollars on the venture. Many other companies are also paving the way. Bell Atlantic in Virginia, TCI in Seattle, and Viacom in California. In Orlando, Florida, Time Warner is installing fiber optic lines to connect 150,000 homes. 
Trials are being conducted around the U.S. to build a model of the home interactive center. The models vary from company to company, but they all promise the same menu of services. Mail call. There's electronic mail. Oh, memo from Bob. And banking at home. And of course, home shopping. Oh, there. I've narrowed it down to four stores. At the top of everyone's list are movies on demand, supposedly the big money maker. But movies on demand may not happen as soon as many predict. That's because although the technology exists to use the computer as an interactive tool with the TV, it's very expensive to build the systems that will deliver these services on demand. The video servers, which will provide these services, require huge storage capacity to hold and play back the films at an acceptable quality. And no one has yet built a cheap enough video server, though everyone is working on it. To deliver a movie on demand, the film must first be digitized, turned into zeros and ones. But that takes up a lot of computer storage space in the video server that will deliver the film. Then, you need transmission lines to send out all those films. But there is still no standard transmission system. Finally, at the receiving end, you need a TV set top box to receive and decode the film. There are many different models, but no one has built an affordable one yet. But in spite of the obstacles, there's a frantic race to be first on the market with a workable interactive network. Eric Schmidt of Sun Microsystems. No one knows how this will play out. There are huge battles yet to be fought out be between, for example, the telecommunications carriers and the cable companies. No one knows for sure which will come to dominate. They're all competing to create a vision of the future which has been called the 500-channel universe. But how realistic is that vision? I actually don't think 500 channels is going to happen very quickly. But let me tell you what I think will happen instead. Um, there are roughly one-third of the households in North America have personal computers in them. There are estimates that up to half of the personal computers sold in the next year will go into homes. There are estimates that up to 90% of those personal computers sold will have CD-ROMs in them. So there's a tremendous revolution going on in parallel with television, which is the importance of computing at home. Getting those computers connected into networks which integrate with your television set, which allow you to order things and interact with things in your television set, is a much shorter term opportunity and something which is in place today. People are working on that. And I think that's probably going to drive it much more than this 500 channel vision, which will take much longer to, to happen. One cable company, Videotron of Montreal, runs a commercially successful interactive TV service called VideoWay without movies on demand. Video Way president, Sylvie Lalonde. Maybe it's a wonderful concept. Maybe people will be delighted to uh, select what movie they want to see at this particular moment among a, a library of 10,000 movies. I like the concept myself. But I know that economically speaking, it doesn't make any sense. Videotron offers its 220,000 subscribers pre-scheduled pay-per-view movies, as well as specialized services such as home shopping and banking. There is also some interactivity. Hockey fans watching a game at home can pick what camera angle to watch or order a replay. <laughs> there are also interactive games of chance and quiz games. Lequel de ces romans Alexandre Jardin a-t-il écrit? Oh mon Dieu! Videotron researched the field before providing interactive services to find out what subscribers would like and would be willing to pay for. The study was conducted by University of Montreal's André Caron. 
what has emerged is really the what I call the 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 playfulness or the the play aspect of video way is that the basically video way and video games are those that that have come out very strongly uh, and people will spend the three four hours a week playing these different video games uh, closely followed we'll have some interactive television for a few hours and we'll also have what we call telematic services which is basically looking up your horoscope or your your uh, um, lotto numbers, your winning lotto numbers, or, or looking at the weather and things like this. And, and those are things you do like maybe five minutes here, five minutes there, but after a whole week, then it counts them to uh, maybe an hour or so. Interactivity is not new. Time Warner was selling interactive TV in Columbus, Ohio in the early 80s, but dropped it after a few years. Will interactivity be more successful today and eventually replace personal shopping or going out to the movies? Media observer, Mark Stallman. All of these uh, parts of our lives, uh, shopping, banking, and even uh, playing games, are intensely social activities. We are, by nature, intensely social animals. It's extremely important to us to go to the store where other people are around. There are differences between men and women, uh, certainly in this regard, there are some aspects where we know exactly what it is we want to buy and we, all we're concerned about is price and delivery. But that's not the largest part uh, of life by any means. To imagine that you could replace a complex web of social relationships in all of these other areas uh, of our lives with clicking buttons on a television screen is lunatic. Uh, it is insane to imagine that that could happen. And that's exactly the reason why time after time after time these trials have failed. But there is one area in our lives that is being fundamentally changed by the merging of computers with visual communications devices. And that's in the workplace. Telepresence. Communicating across distances by video computer is becoming more common in offices as multimedia computers become more affordable. Computer-mounted cameras allow participants to see one another as they work on their computer screens. Variations of the multimedia workstation are being developed almost daily. So what I want to do is modify this drawing to reflect the ATM network. So ATM technology asynchronous transfer mode is the basis of telepresence communication. It makes it possible to send data, voice, and images more efficiently than ever before over a single telephone line. This telepresence project at the University of Toronto is headed by scientific director William Buxton. The design incorporates the computer into a familiar workspace such as a drawing board. The portholes things are going over the public switch network so that uh, we can really connect with anybody who's got this new technology. The same principle guides the clearboard design developed by Japanese researcher Hiroshi Ishii. The clearboard uses the traditional desktop as a shared workspace. Co-workers in separate offices can talk to and see each other in a natural setting while working on the same material. Now with this type of scan, we could see... Telepresence is also used extensively in medicine to transmit images for diagnosis, research and teaching. Whether it's a fracture that can't be seen by x-ray... In southwestern Ontario, a computer network links London's three hospitals, the university, and a research institute. Images transmitted on the network allow medical staff in different hospitals to discuss diagnosis and treatment of patients without leaving their office. Or what we call an the network also gives the hospitals access to resources beyond their immediate community, such as the supercomputer at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. The computer is also changing personal work habits, allowing more people to work at home. 
Many see it as liberating them from rigid office routines, which gives them more time to spend with their families. Most new technologies often create labor-saving devices that promise to put an end to drudgery. The machines of the Industrial Revolution, for example, were also supposed to liberate workers, but often ended up enslaving them instead. Will it be any different with the personal computer, which promises more freedom for people to work at home and in their own time? University of Toronto sociologist Gail Moore I think it's very dangerous, again, to talk about how wonderful and liberating it is. It is indeed very true that it can be. If you're a, a middle-class professional with a lovely home on a ravine, with a private office, uh, a nanny looking after your children, and you don't have to come into your office downtown every day. For example, teleworking's not an all or nothing. You might be working from home two, three days a week. You have the flexibility. You have a certain amount of autonomy in your job. It, it can seem to a very wonderful way of combining private and personal life uh, in that case. On the other hand, I think we can see the other end of this, the situation, a single mother with a couple of children in a very small apartment. She doesn't have even a private. We've come a long way in a very short time from the ENIAC, the electronic numerical integrator and calculator of 40 years ago. There were only a few of these monster machines back then, and only an elite few were allowed to use them. Today, computers are almost everywhere, and the changes they bring threaten to leave a lot of people behind. First big problem is that there's a marginalization of people who, have, who either choose to or are unable to adapt to the changes in technology. There's no question that that's occurring. It's a very serious society problem. The second is that there is now uh, labor mobility in the sense that uh, it's possible for corporations to relocate operations to other parts of the world with lower labor costs. You can literally, using telecommunications, lower your cost of operations by disenfranchising one set of workers and empowering another set. Again, a huge issue for high-tax, high-wage uh, countries, uh, states, counties, provinces, and what have you. So those trends are going to go on. Our politicians seem clueless on how to solve those problems, and I don't expect them to be solved. I expect us to, to grind through it, and it, I believe that, that would be very painful. In just 50 years, modern inventions like nuclear power, space travel, television, and now the microchip and the personal computer have made enormous changes in our lives. Not only has the rate of innovation accelerated in the second half of this century, but the new technologies have combined in unforeseen ways to create new opportunities as well as social dislocations. In the rush to travel on the information highway, we have little time to ask ourselves where we are going so fast and why. A profound revolution is occurring in our social structures because of the personal computer. In just a few years, it went from being a calculating machine and word processor to a communications device that has changed the daily lives and habits of millions of people around the world. Between 20 and 30 million people in 130 countries use the computer to get on the Internet, an interconnecting computer network that allows them to retrieve and exchange information and to communicate with one another. Many consider the Internet to be the real information highway. The information is not really the main event. The information sets the background. What's really going on here is uh, access to other people. We've made a very subtle but profound shift in the nature of our communications. And that is we've shifted from a world of people talking to people directly to a world of machines talking to machines on the behalf of people. The Internet took off like a rocket in terms of usage because of people talking to people. The computer went from being a solitary device in the 1980s when you word processed all by yourself to a social device where you communicated with other people. What this really is is a revolution towards a new kind of community relationship among people separated by distance. For that community, which is growing at a rate of 10% every month, the Internet has become an almost mythical global living room. Theodore Rojak of California State University. 
perhaps the most uh, colorful and in some respects most redeeming uh, example of information technology that uh, I can think of in the sense that it was developed for military purposes but then rapidly um, expanded to include a lot of other um, uh, human purposes of uh, simple communication between people for purposes of intellectual exchange or um, conversation. <clears throat> I mean, some of the oldest um, conferences on the Internet have to do with science fiction, and it has always had a lot to do with sex and courtship. Uh, so it's a very um, human element in this strange format called uh, the, in the Internet. Graduate student Maya Sari is typical of thousands in her generation who are hooked on the Internet. I think Internet is interesting, even just as a function of being able to filter a lot of people through your life that you wouldn't necessarily have access to geographically. Say you move into a new town, a new job, you have a small office, you don't, you know, where do you go? The bars. Well, what if you don't like smoke? What if you don't like beer? What if you don't like those environments? Or the club? What if you're not a jock? These are really interesting. Uh... When you get on the keyboard, you're placing um, a, an extra barrier of communication. And it's just you and your keyboard and your screen, and that gives you a lot of freedom. A lot of people who might not otherwise speak up, might not otherwise express their opinions, suddenly find that they're the king of their keyboard. You know, they are the captain of the information highway. So people find it very easy to express opinions. There's nothing lonelier than a person by themselves in cyberspace. To me, people miss the opportunity of networking and of computing when they think of one person, one computer, interacting with a computer by themselves. I want my cyberspace to be full of the people that I work with. What I want when I look at my computer is I want to see the faces and virtual images of all the people that I collaborate with who might be physically all around the world. And I want them to be as close to me as they possibly can be. So I, I don't see the alienation and the isolation that many people see in these new cyberspaces. I see rather as a way of having more friends and more of a community. It is a virtual community in the sense that I cannot physically touch them. But in all other aspects, I can feel them and know them and care about them and, and in the future, not only will I be able to type messages to them, but I'll also be able to talk to them and, in fact, see them through video. For journalist Jack Kapitska, it's a rich mine of information, but it's also much more. What we're talking about here is jungle drums. This is thousands upon thousands, now make that millions of voices, all telling you what's on their mind. There's a drawback to that when there's nobody mediating this stuff the noise level that you get is colossal. I mean, you use, it's like a, a cocktail party at which 25 million people have been invited. And your job is to go out and find the right conversational grouping for you. But it brings unbelievable new problems because the volume of people on the Internet that have never been there before, they're not scientists, they're not people using the net to get information from one community to another. They're browsing, wandering, publishing. Uh, suddenly the issues of pornography, of censorship, of law enforcement's desire to wiretap, to capture criminals, all of these uh, challenges are raised. And we're watching legislation in every country that is attempting to control things. The battle for control of the Internet is going to be quite interesting. Right now, as far as I can see, the Internet is bursting at the seams. There are too many users, too little hardware. The university has never quite understood what it was they were getting into when they started up. It was basically um, a research tool for scholars. The scholars graduated, got out of school, and wanted to stay on the Internet. They kind of liked it. And now what's happening is that every year, all the universities in North America, the world, are graduating scholars who are suddenly finding themselves at the Internet. And they want on board. The demand is colossal. It's just like the Wild West. Anything goes. And, of course, over time, laws will be created and societies and sheriffs and all of that will be invented to deal with this new cyberspace. But this new reality is occurring very quickly, and no single company, no single technology is in charge. So I think that the Internet as we know it today will be the founding architecture of the national information infrastructure, and that the other technologies that people are investing in, primarily cable and video, will become part of it, but will not be the primary core of it. I actually believe that the Internet will be the primary core. The convergence of today's two major technologies, the TV and the computer, 
raises questions about how we receive and process sensory and other information. These technologies can easily fool us into believing the mediated experiences we get through our TV sets and the second-hand contacts we make with others in our computers are the real thing. But there's a big difference between the virtual reality of the technical world and being out here touching the real world. Author William McKibben believes we are living in an age of missing information because most of our life's experiences are second-hand. What's amazing about the moment in which we live, probably more than anything else, is that it's the first time in human history when the bulk of human experience is now secondary and indirect and prepackaged through the media instead of primary and direct. If you look at how people spend their lives, um, the biggest chunk of our discretionary time is given over to watching other people have experiences on, on TV on our behalf. There are a lot of differences between the signals that the natural world gives you and, and the ones that come across the TV. I was out sitting on top of this mountain watching the sunset. You know, what more cliched experience could there be? Um, but by God, it took a heck of a long time for the sun to go down. You know, you had to sit there and watch the sunset hour after hour if you really watch the whole thing. And as a sort of good child of the TV age, I was sort of ready to switch to another program, you know, and, and be sort of jolted with something else. And it was good to be reminded that that wasn't the point, you know, that there was, that this sort of slower rhythm um, was, in fact, um, wonderful in its own way and, and allowed you to think differently and, and to reach different places. As we look at computer technology, one of the things that one sees we, is that we are doing things more and more by means of devices and less and less by means of people. That is, we don't anymore rely on the knowledge stored in people. We go to the memory of the program of what is in our computers. And what I'm concerned about is that we lose both the ability and the pleasure of interacting with people and respecting what is in their memory, in their knowledge, and what they can contribute. This technology is called information technology. And uh, what it does, essentially, is to store and transmit um, and distribute information. It processes information. That's an extremely valuable function. And if you limited it to that, it would have a major role to play in our economic life and many other aspects of our lives. The problem is that the word information, often for opportunistic or very sloppy reasons, has been expanded to include everything. Calling something the information revolution implies that there's some information out there. Now, of course, that's patent nonsense. What there is is a surfeit of data. And data does not become information until it informs or can serve as the basis for decision-making. That hence the term, information. And what, uh, what's missing in this large equation are the tools that let me massage and render, in a sense, that data into a form where it does inform me and, and for my specific purposes and my specific problems. Information has become a kind of commodity that comes indiscriminately directed at no one in particular. And uh, I think this is one of the most serious problems humanity is going to face in the coming century. Not how to increase the amount of information, but how to get rid of it. Because I think information has become a form of garbage now. You know, it is possible to have too much information. That's something that I call data glut, and which the data merchants don't want to admit. But, you know, you could set the world up in such a way that people would be so inundated with information from many different sources and through many different technologies that they might come to a point at which they're paralyzed and they can't think at all. It's as if our, immu our information immune system has broken down so that we have no filters, no protection against information. So people don't really know what things mean. We know 
we know of lots of things and it keeps pouring in but many people are deeply troubled about uh, a fight, whether or not they can find a sense of meaning in all of this we don't need any more information I mean we marinate in unbelievable quantities of information now we need I mean we need time to reflect upon some of it think about it make some small part of it useful to us in our lives you know we need companionship in which to sort of put it into practice and we need a certain amount of solitude real solitude without something talking in our ears or flashing on a screen um, you know in order to think about it One American playwright wrote The Night of the Iguana, Tennessee, Tennessee Williams. Williams. Tennessee Williams. <laughs> Tennessee oh, you just could say that. Yeah. <laughs> Smart kid. Entertainment is at the top of the consumer hierarchy. So the first thing new technologies get used for is, is always play and diversion and entertainment. And it will be no different this time. Yeah. And it's already happening. I nailed it. Yeah, we got it. We can now play games online by personal computer against unseen opponents half a continent away. It's a sign of things to come. Yes, 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 yes. yes, yes, yes. <laughs> the kind of games that will get played in, in this new environment are not the lonely asteroid existence of one player all by themselves alone in a video game. It's going to be an electronic environment where multiple players can come together and play in a way that's a social experience. John, you know this one. The Amazing Mr. Lincoln. The Amazing Mr. Lincoln. Quiz and parlor games have been adapted for the computer to be played online. But the games that promise to be the most popular and the most profitable will be interactive video games. Video game makers are in a race to get their games on the system. The two biggest, Sega and Nintendo, want to create cable channels to beam interactive versions of their popular arcade games into people's homes. I think most of the major media companies and some of the technology companies are fairly certain that an addictive kind of medium is a good way to make a lot of money. Um, and I think if you look at some of the applications that people are really focused on right now, whether it's home shopping, whether it's gambling, you know, or whether it's game playing, multi-user game playing, um, all of those are fairly addictive activities. My sincere hope is that the informational quality and the educational quality and the community building aspect um, and potential of this technology isn't going to get overlooked in this mad rush for immediate return. The technology is changing the face of the entertainment industry. In Las Vegas, video games are elbowing out the slot machines. Multi-million dollar hotels like the Luxor are designed to attract the family business. Built around high-tech video games, they are the theme parks of the next century. These are called the Reelys, the new virtual reality theme parks. Here, cyberspace flights projected on 20-meter high screens replace the tame riverboat rides of yesterday's Disneylands. Sega is planning to build up to 100 high-tech theme parks around the world. 15 of these will be in Canada. The video game industry is highly profitable, estimated at more than $10 billion worldwide. It's bigger than the movies and almost as big as the music industry. The new playthings of the video game industry include flight simulators. High-tech trainers once available only to the most advanced armed forces of powerful nations. I basically think we're breeding a generation of fighter pilots. 
and you know the, the hand-eye coordinations that they're learning from the video games that they're playing with now will be extremely useful as our graphic user interfaces evolve and as joysticks and point-and-click interfaces become something that more and more people are using on a daily basis. The industry wants to expand from the arcade to the home, where families can play video games on cable channels. Sega and Nintendo now beam their games into Japanese homes by satellite. In Canada, Sega has applied to the CRTC for its own video game channel, a prospect that disturbs educators like Sandra Campbell. Children have a very powerful capacity to move into the world of fantasy. This technology moves them into the world of fantasy for destruction not for rehabilitation, not for positive social benefit, but for destruction. So they're being socialized into a belief system that says it's a very dangerous world out there. There are aliens. There are aliens who aren't like us, who are different. Those aliens will destroy you if you don't destroy them first. Video games that have already proved popular in arcades and on cassette can bring huge profits when they become available on cable. Some of the most violent games are also among the most profitable. Mortal Kombat was released in September 1993 with a $10 million advance marketing budget. And I know that by Christmas 1993, the sales were 150 million U.S. of Mortal Kombat. Now, tar they targeted that game at boys 8 to 12. Because the game is interactive, it is more powerful as a socializer of children. It invites them into the world of the scripted game. It invites them to imitate the behavior of the pro protagonist. And if the behavior is ultraviolence or violence, the child is rewarded. The protagonists use only violence as a solution to problems. They never use language, they never use dialogue, they never use their intellect to solve problems in non-violent ways. They, they resort to usually a technology to blow up the problem. No form of entertainment today is complete without a heavy dose of virtual reality. Pretty soon you'll be playing games like this. Tick, 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 tick. Whoa, I'm getting sick. The movie makers who sell their fantasies on the big silver screen are turning to computer scientists to help them create virtual worlds they could only imagine before the computer came along. Some of these worlds exist only in the helmets and visors of the wearer. Look up, look up, look up. Look behind you, look behind you. Turn around. Look behind you again, look behind you. How deeply are we sinking into virtual reality? I'm an optimist about virtual reality. I think that it will provide us a distant mirror on everyday reality and lead us to treasure actual reality that much more because it, no matter how good you can do something in a computer, it's still an impoverished world compared to the real world. Uh, there will, without doubt, be people who will bury themselves in virtual reality and have a case of reality jitters, but that's not new. I mean. That's the novel Madame Bovary, the woman who got in trouble because she read too many romance novels. Well, we'll have the cyberspace equivalents of the Madame Bovary in the next few decades.
What will that cyber world of the next few decades be like? We are already beginning to see some of its effects. The big impact, I believe, will, has to do with the people who choose to master the technology will be more capable of their own direction and decisions. They will have more information, have ability to empower themselves, and to, and to, do, to do the model of the independent, intelligent citizen. And that, that alone is an enormous change. Uh, again, 100 years ago, in fact, 300 years ago, no one thought that it was okay for people to read the Bible, right? And that, of course, changed and changed, changed religion and so forth. This new empowerment is quite fundamental, and it's a very big society change. Before we deploy these things out on the masses and do wreck havoc, perhaps, we can actually catch some of the problems and also recognize some of the sweet spots where we can really do wonderful things. I mean, I'm just as pessimistic about these things as the next person, but I try and balance that with an optimism. I, it's what I call skepticism. It's half skeptic and half optimist. And if you go into it with this balanced perspective, we can say we can shape these things. What's clear? Technology is not good. Technology is not bad. But it sure as heck isn't neutral. And it's only by conscious action and by design that we will make it one or the other. And be sure, if we do nothing, it will be bad. It is only by proactive action that it will be good. And now the question is, so what are you going to do about it? All new technologies create change. The computer is no exception. But the changes it has brought about have occurred in a much shorter time than with most previous technologies. going to be able to shape this new world or is the technology evolving so fast that it's already heading us into directions we can't control.